Hi, welcome to SpaceCast. I'm Josh, and we have a special visitor today. Today we have Dr. Brian Whedon from the Secure World Foundation. Brian, welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming up to talk to us. Uh, and today's topic, we're going to be talking about space security. And your organization, the Secure World Foundation, you've recently published the, the Global Counter Space Capabilities Report. Can you tell us a little bit about that report and uh, some of the highlights of it? Sure. Um, the report was born out of our interest to see uh, more information and details about what is going on in space and the space security threats, and particularly the counter space capabilities being developed by multiple different countries. So uh, that, that, and I, you're talking about including, um, you know, direct ascent, ASAT, orbital, uh, directed energy, RF, cyber, all correct. that's covered in your report. Correct. All, all, the, all those major categories. You know, as m most people are probably aware, you know, through the various media reports and statements from the government over the last several years, there's been very much increased concerns uh, from the U.S. government, but also other countries, about the growing uh, threats to satellites, including both environmental, but also potentially hostile threats, as more and more countries uh, see the value of using space for military capabilities, and then also of being able to interdict those capabilities of another country should there be a conflict. So there's all this talk and all this concern about what's going on, but very little hard details, mm -hmm. because a lot of the details are you know, coming out of intelligence collection or military assessments, and I think rightly so, they're generally not talked openly because of the classified data. So we thought, well, what can we do to kind of dig through all of the open sourced and publicly available data to sort through that? And can we do our own independent assessment of what's going on that, if so, then could be much more widely shared? So that was sort of why we did the report. And, and the goal was to help use it to inform Congress and decision makers, as well as the public about what's going on and have a more open discussion about not only the threats, but what we should do about them. Because you know that is an issue that's going to affect everyone in space, not just the militaries. Absolutely. And, and could you go into any of the highlights of any of the ones that you remember? Like the, the video I have playing behind the thing is the Looch one. I think that's mentioned in yeah. the report. Uh, yeah, so one of the, the big themes that we've tracked over last year's first edition and then this year, the, the second edition, is the, I would say, proliferation of rendezvous and proximity capabilities and demonstrations. We've seen both the United States, Russia, and China conducting, or continue to conduct a series of demonstrations and tests of RPO capabilities, both in low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit. Mm -hmm. And in, in most cases, you know, there's not a lot of public data on why they're doing this. And these capabilities could be used for, you know, relatively innocuous things like satellite servicing or debris removal or collecting intelligence or inspections. But they could also be the baseline for core or LASAC capabilities. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of concern about them. So, you know, we've been tracking those and using publicly available data in open catalogs or from amateur observers or from other sources to try and keep track of what's going on, who is doing it, and then also do some analysis of the behavior to try and assess, you know, was this a core release test? Was it more of an inspection? Or, or did it seem like more of an intelligence collection? Trying to do that assessment of what was actually going on. Um, and then a broader assessment of, you know, what does all these tests mean for what the different countries are trying to develop? So do you think that co-orbital ASATs is sort of the, the, the hardest to detect uh, ahead of time uh, in the event of something going and uh, happening in, in space? Because, um, you know, direct ascent ASAT, you, you light a pretty big candle and you can see it. And uh, directed energy are usually be limited to your geography below, so you'd you know you'd have you'd only be able to do that at certain times during satellite overflights. But orbital, you know, they could be anywhere. Right? Well, uh, I would say yes and no. I mean, so for example, the United States is the only country that has the space-based infrared warning system to detect missile launches worldwide. Okay. So from the U.S. perspective, yeah, sure, they can detect a launch and and try and do a DA sat. But pretty much every other country in the world, unless you're an ally getting that feed from the U.S. You don't have that capability so you, to detect. You don't even see the direct ascent. Correct. Gotcha. And, and the timeline is so quick for those, right? You're, it's just a few minutes if you're targeting in you know low LEO orbit. Mm -hmm. um, it can be really difficult to, to deal with. Um, 
you know, the by by contrast, the rendezvous and prox ops are, and the co-orbital. Uh, yes, it could theoretically come from everywhere, but most of the ones we've seen, they don't happen like that. You know, this is a, a, an approach that is happening over days, if not weeks. Mm-hmm. And you know, more and more countries have SSA capabilities to be able to track things in space. And so I, I think it's you know it's a little bit. I think it is fairly open in terms of being able to see what's going on. Um, you know, partic- especially compared to things like jamming and RF and cyber attacks, sure. which are probably the most difficult to attribute. Um, the core relays that stuff, uh, or and, and the RPOs, uh, th- they're I think they're easier to see. Um, generally, you can attribute them because you generally say, oh, that's this object that came off of this launch. The real challenging thing, I think, is to figure out the intent, mm-hmm. right? Is that thing coming close because it's just changing its orbit? Is that thing coming close because it's wants to take some pictures? Or is it coming close because it wants to do something hostile to me? That is a really difficult problem, and I think one the military is still struggling with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, identifying what's normal and what's What's nefarious? Uh, so, right before you guys published this report, you had a last-minute event. Uh, India launched an ASAT, and they they did what they could to try to minimize debris. You know, they did a downward downward approach on the satellite that they took out, as far as we can tell, and uh, it still generated quite a bit of debris. And uh, can you go into how that affected? Well, your report, obviously, it's in there a little bit, but how's that changed the playing field for? Uh, global counter space capabilities. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. It actually it happened the day after we sent the report to the printers, so we had to did. do an yeah. emergency halt and you know put <laughs> it in. Um, you know, we actually had in last year's edition of the report, we had uh, we talked about India and we talked about their desire to develop these capabilities and the debate that had been going on in India about whether or not to do a test. So we were well aware that this was a possibility. Um, and when it actually happened, of course, we were a bit surprised, but not in, not maybe not as surprised as everyone else, because again, we knew this was a debate that it, they had been having since 2007 when China tested their ASAT. Mm-hmm. Um, that kicked off uh, uh, a, a debate in India because you know India sees itself in a you know regional power competition with China um, and is very much kind of wary of what China is doing and and trying to also. Um, you know, keep up with China in terms of prestige and what's going on in space. So, those were some of the big drivers behind why India decided to test their own weapon. Uh, and, and yes, you know, the the Indian ASAT test mission Shakti was very similar to the U.S. Uh, destruction of USA 193 back in 2008, and that both events generated. Um, uh, a few, you know, 200 or so pieces of catalog space debris, as opposed to the 3,000 pieces of catalog space debris generated by the 2007 uh, Chinese ASAT test, right? And, and and also at a much lower altitude, uh, roughly 300 kilometers for the mission Shakti, uh, which meant that nearly all that debris is going to re-enter fairly quickly. Now. Uh, the, what the Indians said publicly and kind of the propaganda around the test was not quite what was reality. Um, in fact, it's interesting, you know, they absolutely said they, they hit it at a downward angle to minimize debris, but then they released this mission video that had the telemetry from the interceptor showing it basically hitting at an upward angle. Oh, I didn't <laughs> see that. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, there definitely was an attempt to spin it mm-hmm. uh, in a certain way that did not quite match the facts, but it was done in a somewhat more responsible manner than what China did. That said, we are still very concerned about it because, you know, we see the possibility this means that there may be more countries that decide, you know what, doing this, testing an ASAT weapon by blowing up a satellite is how you demonstrate you're a space power. And I think that could be pretty bad for the space environment in general, because not everyone may have the same dedication to doing it in a quote unquote responsible manner. Right. Um, and even if they try, not everyone may be competent to do it in a responsible manner. So that I think is our concern is not necessarily the actual impact it had on the environment, but more of the the po- geopolitical precedent it may have sent and the message it may have sent to other countries. 
So how integral to the U.S. is our space security to national security? Uh, it deeply integral. Uh, and this is the big challenge for the U.S. Uh, over the last two and a half decades or so, the U.S. military has put a lot of emphasis on building space capabilities that enhance conventional warfighting and integrating those capabilities into our military operations. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to find a military operation going on right now around the world that does not involve space in some context. And many of them are utterly reliant on space, either for intelligence or for targeting um, or for communications or, or BD, both, you know, uh, post damage assessment, some other capability. So, so the, the present the, the the space capabilities made the U.S. military much more effective. The downside, of course, is that that means we're very reliant on them, mm -hmm. and there has not been a similar focus on improving the resilience of those capabilities and the ability to either resist attacks or degrade gracefully in the face of attacks. There's been a, a policy effort from the U.S. since 2011 to try and become more resilient. And I would say it's had very limited success in actually being implemented. There's a lot of institutional and bureaucratic and cultural resistance to, to going down that path. So the U.S. still struggles with that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, from a U.S. perspective, the challenge is that we have other countries, primarily Russia and China, that are investing a lot of money in developing a range of counter space capabilities, kinetic, non-kinetic, you know, core relay sat, uh, DA sat, laser jamming, cyber. And there's a big question as to just what the U.S. military is going to do to be able to deal with those threats. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, for more information, go to swfound.org. The link's below. The link to your report is below. We'll provide that as well. So take a look at the report. Uh, for more information, follow Brian on Twitter, LinkedIn, and go to the website. Thanks again. My pleasure.